So I have not been shy in sharing with you that I am a huge fan of 48 volt electrical systems in an automotive application. And that is the case for a couple of reasons. The biggest being, at least currently, most of them are tuned for performance. Now we've driven these from BMW to Land Rover to Mercedes. And I would argue it's Mercedes that is trying to corner the market on this whole 48 volt mild hybrid craze. So much so that they have just dropped off to the hangar another one with slightly less power, yet still tuned for performance, that happens to be conveniently contained in a more attractive wrapper. Now you may remember we've driven a very similar flavor of this engine in a number of 53 series AMGs and there you also may remember it was about 67 more horsepower and the reason why it had an auxiliary compressor that acted kind of like an electric supercharger that worked in conjunction with a 48 volt electrical system which this engine also has. Same architecture, uh, integrated starter generator motor that sits between the engine and the nine speed torque converter automatic, no accessory drive, adds up to 21 horsepower through the EQ boost system. That in turn drives all four wheels. Uh, fuel economy, that's not really the point of this mild hybrid. 20, 25, 22 combined. Zero to 60, it's not as good as the GT53, but not really a huge difference. It's 4.8 to 60, as opposed to 4.4. You guys may remember from our previous GT four-door episodes, these things, they ain't lightweights. 4,530 pounds, or depending on how you express your weights and measures, 2,055 kilograms for this specific application. With that Sport Plus, here we go. Oh, that's not bad. Actually, if I'm honest, it feels a lot like the GT53 we already drove, at least in this mode. You know what? Let's try something different. Let's go back to comfort mode, backing down to 2000 RPM. You can definitely tell even in comfort mode, the sweet spot is between two and say 3500 RPM. There's good passing power here, but you can definitely tell there's less of an edge with this one than with the GT53. And this is where we do have a really big piece of information. The weight difference between the two is only 20 some odd pounds. It's like 23 pounds. Here's the script if you didn't know it. These cars, while very sexy to look at, and yes, they look like four doors have been grafted onto a GT two door, in reality, underneath that vehicle, it's an E-Class, uh, which means it's independent multi-link all the way around. However, unlike the GT 63S we have already driven, it is not an air ride system. It is not on offer in a GT43. Instead, it rides on steel springs, does have adjustable dampers and a torsion bar. From there, it shares most of the hardware with the GT53 you and I have already driven. Aspects like six piston calipers in the front, a limited slip differential in the rear, and then there's an option in the wheels like in the GT53. The standards are 19s or 21s, which you are looking at here, and yes, they do cost extra money. So soup to nuts between this, the least powerful GT four-door on offer, and the GT63S, the most powerful GT four-door on offer, it's about 200 pounds weight differential, 5%, less than 5% of the weight of the vehicle. So that means you don't notice a huge difference in driving dynamics. This feels very much like the GT53 we already drove. Yes, the difference in setup is noticeable, but that Delta is not enough to change the driving dynamics personality of this AGT four-door. Yeah, you do notice less of an engine. Actually, one thing you do notice is there's less engine noise, and it does sound like a bit of an odd engine. It doesn't sound like a normal internal combustion engine. It sounds almost like a diesel, but it's quieter than a GT63S for obvious reasons. But here's an interesting thing. You notice the road noise from the larger wheels and tires, which are optional on this car, more so here than when they're standard in the GT63S because you hear the exhaust. 
Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game, my Napsis game, with today's contestant. Yet another AMG GT four-door. This one, the least powerful flavor on offer, and one that is also all new for 2021. The Mercedes AMG GT 43 for a base price of $89,900. Now, I do feel it prudent to point out that the base price of the GT53 that we've already driven is just a shade over $10,000 more. To that, we add the color. Now, I'd love to tell you Kumo booked us in one that is Brilliant Blue Magno, but as you can see, this is not Brilliant Blue Magno. Instead, it is Brilliant Blue Metallic. And two things about it. Number one, it is significantly cheaper than Brilliant Blue Magno. Brilliant Blue Magno, for the avoidance of doubt, was about a $4,000 option. This one is a $720 option. And really, we need to take stock here. They're actually giving you more with this option. You get clear coat with this option where you don't in the other one, and you save over $3,000. And we press on to the interior, a stunning auburn brown with a black exclusive Napa leather. This really works well with the brilliant blue metallic. However, it's not cheap, $2,850. To that, we add the natural grain ash wood, and even better, it is no charge. To that, we add the air balance package. That is the atomizer in the glove box. That is an additional $350. Then we add the wheels from the AMG GT63S we already drove. That is the 21-inch cross spoke with gray accents, $3,450. Then the MBUX augmented video that layers this augmented video over the actual maps. It's very cool, $350. Although, why is it not standard on a car that is 90 grand base price? Then the performance exhaust. I think this is a must-have, especially considering this is an AMG, yet it is $1,850. Uh, to that, we add the AMG steering wheel knobs. That is an option, $400. Uh, ventilated and heated front seats, $450. Then the crime of all crimes in this game, Mercedes charges you a base price of about 90 grand for this car. Now, yes, this is the cheapest one on offer, but it's still 90 grand. Yet. The sunroof, which doesn't open, doesn't open, is an additional $2,100. Can we A, make that standard, and B, make it open? Then pressing on to something almost as absurd, the surround view camera, which is standard on most up-level Hyundais and Kias, an additional $500. Then the AMG light display, $250. Then, something that is absolutely stunning on these cars, the black Dinamica headliner, that's the faux suede headliner, $1,600. Then we press on to an additional plug-in for the MBUX infotainment system, this time the MBUX Assistant, which is optional at $200, but here's my confusion with this. Uh, Mercedes-Benz has spent a lot of marketing money uh, to get the word out about MBUX, and for the most part, it works pretty well. But why nickel and dime you to death, especially in a $90,000 car, like 200 here or 350 as we saw before, why not just make the whole suite standard in the car? And this way it's a better experience. And my guess is most people who would buy the cars would brag to their friends, hey, guess what my Mercedes-Benz can do? Kind of like my friends that have Teslas do when I speak to them about their Teslas. Just a suggestion. Anyway, pressing on to the driver's assistance package, which is a rather important option in a Mercedes, as it adds a lot of safety doodads, the most important being the Distronic Plus, which is the adaptive cruise control and sort of level two autonomy. No, this is not a self-driving car, but it will keep distance between you and the car in front of you and the car in back of you, but also keep the car in the lane for up to 30 seconds. That is $1,950. Then the only other thing we add is the destination from Sindelfingen, Deutschland for $1,050 for a total retail price of $107,995. Let's have a more global discussion about these 48 volt mild hybrid systems, not just the one in the Mercedes. Because as of late, I've been seeing a lot of comments from you guys that ask the same question. 
why do I think these will be more reliable over the future? Which is the reason why I think these things are exciting. If you look at them, they're currently in Land Rovers, BMWs, this Mercedes, and then of course, there's Airbus A350s and Boeing 787s. But let's put the aviation applications aside. The main reason why I want to believe these things are going to be more reliable in the future, I'm not saying there's a guarantee, why I want to believe is because there's less moving parts. In the Mercedes application, there is no accessory drive. Sadly, in the BMW and the Land Rover, they put the integrated starter generator motor on an accessory drive. I do not think that will be a good long-term solution, and I can already tell a difference in the performance of the different vehicles. Which brings us back to the way Mercedes integrates their integrated starter generator motor into the system. This is more seamless. The handoff, you don't notice it as much as you do in the Land Rover and the BMW. You do notice more assist in the Mercedes. It feels more, electric is not the right term. It feels like there's more torque coming from this system than it is in the BMW or the Land Rover systems. So if you're taking stock thus far, one of the biggest benefits is the less moving parts and that handoff, that seamless handoff and additional torque. It's best in the Mercedes, it's good in the Land Rover and the BMW. But the reason why I pay attention to this space and why I'm so eager about it, let's be honest, these vehicles are incredibly complex. As such, reliability is spotty when they get past five years. Which brings us to the third, and I would argue the biggest potential benefit of a 48 volt electrical system as it pertains to reliability, and that is less load on the engine. Just think about the architecture of this system in the Mercedes. There is no accessory drive, meaning, for example, there is no air conditioning compressor. That load that normally would be on the internal combustion engine to heat and cool the car is now pushed off to an electric pump or an electric air conditioner. Which brings us to the point of the discussion. How does less load on the engine translate to potentially better reliability, say five years or longer? Well, that would be less wear and tear on the engine. Is this a guarantee? No. But it's that potential is the reason why I get so excited about this and why I pay attention to it. Because Airbus and Boeing are already starting to see some benefits by taking like de-icing systems and HVAC systems off the engines and the engines become not only more efficient, but last longer. So the question is, will that happen in the car world as well? As a PS to that discussion, there are two other benefits to a 48 volt electrical system that don't necessarily show up in this example. The first being suspension control systems. We've seen this in Audis, Bentleys, and other more complex Mercedes-Benz products that have those very intricate electronically controlled anti-roll bar systems that literally counteract lean of a high performance, very large vehicle. Very effective. I don't know how reliable it will be in the future. However, I gotta believe it will take some of the load off of the very complex air ride systems, which are about $2,000 a corner to replace. And the second benefit that doesn't really apply to this example, but is germane to this discussion, and also happens to be all of the following. A bit pie in the sky, a harkens back to my Lotus days, and frankly has not been realized in any of the cars we have driven with a 48 volt electrical system. And that is the benefit of the architecture of the system. You see, these can use a different type of wiring, a lighter type of wiring, which hopefully would lower the weight of the vehicle and provide more options to engineers to be able to do things in the future. Kind of like that suspension system we talked about, but stuff we can't envision yet today. And the reality is all of these things are overweight pigs. Like this is 4,500 pounds, the BMW and the Land Rover we drove with the system. They weren't lightweight for the vehicles that they are. So I'm hoping that these systems will be able to lower the weight of the vehicle because there's less components and frankly, different wiring. With that, back to this specific example. It is magnificent to drive just like the GT53 was, but just like the GT53, and the GT63S, the struggle is it's an E-Class underneath. And this is all about the aesthetics rather than the way it drives. Me, for what this specific vehicle costs, 
Kumo and I would have to have a brilliant blue Magno E63S wagon full stop. Which brings us to the wish list and tying all of this together. If I am reading the tea leaves correctly, the fact that this flavor of GT exists means Mercedes is looking to round out the edges of the portfolio with the 48 volt electrical system. So think of this as the bottom end of the range. Now the wish list is, can we have something at the top end of the range? So apply the 48 volt electrical system to the GT63S and above. So there you have it, nerding out about aviation technology in cars, as well as a wish list, which means I have to turn this around to you guys and feel free to opine in the comments below as to what we should add to the wish list beyond what we have discussed. And with that, until I see you in the next episode, which will most likely not be a 48 volt electrical system, bis später.